2013. As a reminder to our in-world and web audiences, you can view the full conference schedule on our website at conference.opensimulator.org. And you can post your questions in local chat, on the Ustream chat, or tweet your comments using the hashtag OSCC13. This, this hour, we are happy to introduce Krista Lopes, who will be presenting distributed traffic simulation in Open Simulator. Krista Lopes is a professor in the School of Information and Computer Sciences at the University of California, Irvine. Prior to being in academia, she worked at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center from 1995 to 2001. She is a co-inventor of AOP, Aspect Oriented Programming, a programming language featured in the MIT Technology Review in 2001 as one of the 10 emergent technologies that will change the world. She also serves on the board of the Overt Foundation and is the creator of the Hypergrid, Hypergrid Protocol, which allows avatars to travel between Hypergrid-enabled open simulator grids. Welcome, Krista. Thank you, Joe. <clears throat> OK, so before I start, I'm going to give um, some instructions, like as if I'm a flight attendant. Um, so I am going to uh, start my talk with, with a bunch of uh, videos. So I am assuming that you will have Moab um, accessible viewers. If you don't, I will try to remember to paste the URL of the video on chat so that you can watch it <coughs> on your own browsers. The other thing that I'm going to say is that as I'm uh, getting here on the flow of my presentation, I will very likely ignore anything that comes at me via the chat. So if you want to interrupt me because you, what I'm saying is completely incomprehensible, there's a little dude here on my left. Uh, I call it Oscar. Uh, and if you click on Oscar, um, I will be prompted in green and that will uh, get my attention and then you can say your question or your comment or um, ask me to clarify the bunch of conflicting things that I have been saying. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so here we go. I'm going to start with uh, uh, presenting the problem. So I wanted to do some... Um, okay, we have a question already, Tom Willens. Or is it not a question? Okay, if I don't hear anything in five seconds, I consider it just to be a tryout of, of Oscar on the, my back. Okay, so uh, I wanted to, uh, I'm involved with a company called Encitra, and uh, we are doing urban planning, and some of it, you can hear it tomorrow in the panel. <coughs> um, the, the, the business person that, I, um, that I'm involved with in that company, he'll talk a little bit more about it. I am uh, going to talk about uh, the technicalities of some of the things that we are doing there. Uh, in particular, we are doing a tool for urban planning, early <coughs> phase plans for um, large-scale urban plans. Um, and one of the things that we need uh, very badly is uh, simulations of traffic and people in, in, in urban areas. So if we go and look at the traffic, um, the kinds of traffic that we get in OpenSIM, well, let me put here a, um, a video. <coughs> I'll start with a video here. Let me pop out the web browser. Okay, so I am showing a video from uh, Nebadon's Racer. I hope everyone is able to see it. I'll just let it play a little because I like the song.
Okay, so I stopped it. <coughs> if you are still seeing it, it will stop in a few seconds. Uh, I just wanted to give a feel for the kinds of, when you talk about vehicles and traffic in Second Life and uh, OpenSIM, um, I think these are the kinds of things that come to mind. It's interactive traffic, so you want the people to drive them. <coughs> And what we're looking there is for realism regarding the physics of, of the movement of these vehicles. Um, and that is very fine and dandy for gaming and things like that, but that's not the kinds of things that uh, we have in mind when we want to do traffic simulations in large-scale urban areas. <coughs> so let me play some other videos um, so that uh, we get some inspiration. These are videos that I, I searched on YouTube for the, these are some of the best that I found on YouTube um, that do um, traffic simulation. Um, when you see it play, there's a, um, there's no sound in this video, so don't worry, you will not hear any sound. <coughs> but so when we talk about traffic simulation in for urban planning, these are the kinds of things that we really mean. Um, very large number of vehicles, a large variety, they are not driven by people, they simulate the traffic according to some traffic model um, <clears throat> that may be simple or more complicated depending on what you're trying to, to study. And this particular one seems to be studying here an intersection, a very confusing intersection. Um, so I'll let it play for a little bit because it's kind of cool. <coughs> Okay, so let me move to an another video from the same company, by the way. They seem to be experts in doing traffic simulations. This, this other video is, um, uh, doesn't seem to be using the same tool. It uses some software that is, um, applies photorealism. So you will see something that looks like, you know, almost the technology that you see in, in Hollywood movies to, to simulate urban areas. It's pretty cool. <coughs> It also doesn't have sound, by the way. So this video starts with, um, you know, very simple black and white, um, no urban area, and then the urban area suddenly pops up, and then they apply photorealistic um, textures into it, and uh, next thing you know, it looks like a real city. Okay, so <clears throat> you get the idea. <clears throat> I think you get the idea for what I mean uh, when uh, when I say traffic simulation for urban planning. It's not exactly the kinds of things that we do that we tend to do in OpenSIM and Second Life that's sort of small scale, very interactive. <clears throat> for urban planning, we want very large scale, and so um, large means um, different things. It, it's a lar we want a large space, and when I say large, I mean in the order of kilometers, not just 256 meters. And this is a challenge because uh, the way that this architecture is set up, we have these borders, and, uh, and border crossings are very heavy-duty processes. Uh, they, they introduce lag, rubber banding of the objects. It's, it's really bad. 
And another meaning of large is also on the number of vehicles. So we don't just want 20 vehicles. We want in the order of a thousand, you know, several kinds of vehicles. So it's large in many dimensions. Uh, and this, this is also challenging because, well, you have to move all those vehicles. And if you're not careful, then it's just overloading the server. So those are the technical challenges. And uh, the <clears throat> one of the constraints, though, in doing this work is that I really, we really wanted to use OpenSIM and Second Life Viewer for, for this kind of work. Um, we wanted to use it uh, because it has lots of advantages. As you all know, you are all here, you know what I'm talking about. It's easy to model things. Um, you can, there's this immediate interaction. You log into the world, and it's there. You can see how things are. It's, uh, it's also cheap, much cheaper than some of those uh, software tools that um, high-end consultants use. <coughs> so we had a, this one constraint. We wanted to use OpenSIM and Second Life to make the kinds of tra traffic simulations that I just showed here um, as the, the last couple of videos. So before I explain what we did, I'm going to uh, show you the results first. <coughs> And this is going to pl play the video of um, one of the videos of that we did in Incitra. <coughs> Just a second. For about a minute and a half or something like that. This one has sound, so you will hear sound. Or not. Let's see what happened. Hopefully you will see the web screen pop back uh, inside again. Uh, so the rest of the talk, I'm going to explain um, what I did in order to be able to simulate this very large space <coughs> with a very large number of uh, vehicles that drive around, um, including, uh, I will not talk much about pedestrians. Um, we have uh, uh, people riding bicycles too, although it didn't show in this video. Um, by the way, this so this let me explain just a little context. This video that uh, that I showed you is a is part of a project that we have going on with the city of Uppsala in Sweden. <coughs> we have been working with them to model certain parts of their city that they are um, redeveloping, as well as there's a lobby there who wants to uh, was trying to convince the city to deploy a, um, a podcar system uh, as the mode of public transportation. So that those are the podcars that you saw there. Those podcars don't exist in real life, but uh, that's what this uh, lobby uh, group is trying to to try to deploy a solar powered hyperloop, so to speak, although it's not the same technology, it's, uh, it's um, pod cars of some sort. So 
uh, we, what we had here was a situation that we needed to model an area of about three kilometers by um, 1.5 kilometers. <clears throat> That's the area that we modeled. And we needed to show all these cars and buses and people going around uh, taking lots of routes. So how did we do that? <clears throat> Well, distributed simulation is an old idea, and in fact, uh, OpenSIM and Second Life use this model. Um, that's sort of what they do. Uh, by distributed simulation, what, what, so what is distributed simulation? Is the idea that you have a viewer here that um, connects not just to one server, but to multiple servers on the back end. So in this case, you know, um, there's a, a viewer here that connects to region one, but in connecting to region one, it also opens connections to all the neighboring regions around. So, and all of these regions can potentially be running uh, on different physical servers. So this is a distributed simulation architecture already. <clears throat> so um, what is the problem? The problem is that if I have a little car that's being simulated by the server uh, that's running region one, um, then what happens is if that car moves only within region one, that's no problem. It can just go around and around, that's fine. But if the car wants to move to region eight, uh, then what happens is that there's a process of migration. There's actually, you know, the car gets packaged and sent to the new server over potentially over the network. And that is a very, very heavy duty kind of process and, uh, and it just destroys completely the realism of, of the environment. So we want to uh, avoid that. So we want to avoid migrations altogether. We don't want migrations because they completely destroy the feeling of realism. Um, and another thing that we also want to do is to separate the traffic simulator from the world simulator. I mean, traffic simulators are beasts of their own. In fact, there are several traffic simulator uh, software out there. One of them is well known, it's called the Sumo, Sumo Traffic Simulator. <coughs> And uh, it has, it's an open source one. It has been developed over several years by uh, a group that does those kinds of things. And it's really, it's really good. So we wanted to be able uh, to eventually um, use those simulators that already exist and connect them um, to the, the OpenSIM environment and just have them two together. We haven't done that yet, but that's sort of where we are going. So we want to separate the traffic simulator from the world simulation. Uh, the traffic simulator does the traffic simulation, which is a heavy duty process on itself. And the world seems to the regular virtual world simulation, which is to serve when people log in to, to observe what's going on in the world. So how did we do this? Here's a picture that explains it all. In fact, I can just finish my talk after this picture. Uh, let me try to deconstruct it. So on the right over here, there is the simulated urban area. This is where, this is where we want to see the vehicles and the traffic. Okay? This is the urban area where we want to overlay all the cars and people and whatnot. Uh, and also, this is also the area where human observers log into. So when you log in into the virtual world, this is where you end up. Uh, on the left here, there is a different simulator, which is a different server. That's just the only role of that server is to do the traffic simulation. Um, the, the, so its only goal is to generate the vehicles, move the vehicles, coordinate their behavior, you know, to do the, the, the collision detection. Uh, we also have light traffic lights, so all, do all that simulation. If the lights are red, the cars need to stop. When the lights go green, the cars go. All of that, all of that is also heavy duty processing. And so that's the role here of this traffic simulation. Um, <coughs> So the, the trick now is an interesting one. So what, how can we do that? How can we have this uh, traffic simulator simulate all the traffic while actually seeing the result of that simulation in the urban area that we want to simulate? Okay, so that is sort of advanced uh, trickery here with, uh, with OpenSIM and Second Life, but it's actually a trickery that, uh, believe it or not, it has I believe, been designed uh, by, the, by Linden Lab with them when they made this architecture. It's not explored very often. That's, I think it's sort of a corner case of their design, but it's actually quite an interesting uh, corner. So what you do is the following. When the viewer logs in, 
this means when the person logs in, it, the person logs in to some server here in the urban area, uh, uh, we are opening connections not just to the neighbors of that region, but to a bunch of regions, which this is another configuration, of, an advanced configuration of Open Simulator that we can open connections to a much, much larger area. In our case, we were opening connections to, I, if I remember correctly, about 56 um, regions. Um, so that we had the possibility to have those very large views of, of the environment. But besides opening connections to all of this, we, were also op we are also opening connections to uh, this one connection to the traffic simulator. So the viewer opens one additional connection to this traffic simulation. Um, the person is here in the urban environment but it has a connection back to that other simulator that is somewhere on the grid. And so what happens now is that this traffic simulation is placing all the simulated cars and vehicles not within its boundary, but outside its boundary. So way outside. So, you know, in coordinates, for example, 1,500. Okay, something like that. And it's everything that it does when it moves, it moves within the, that range of coordinates over here, not within its own boundaries. Okay, so that's sort of the trick. And this whole, work, this whole thing works because the viewer is able to understand that, oh, you know what, that uh, simulator over there is uh, um, uh, actually this See, this connection over here is saying that uh, there is a car uh, coming in, in this position, so I'm going to show it to the I'm going to show it to the user. Okay, so that's how the whole thing works, and uh, so in this way, all the load of traffic simulation is offloaded completely from the urban area where the people are, and it's entirely done by the traffic simulator server that's somewhere else on the grid. And all the coordination of the view and the rendering is done by, by the, the person's viewer. That's, that's about it. So it's, the, the architecture is very simple. The actual implementation of this and the deployment is a little bit more tricky. And, uh, but, but I think, it, you know, a, a person who understands a little bit how OpenSIM works would be able to reproduce just based on this explanation. Okay, so that was sort of the, the main interesting bit of technique that I, I wanted to talk about. Uh, the other things that, uh, there are two more things that I want to talk about. It's the traffic model. So I ended up, um, let me go back here. Um, so I did this traffic simulator. Um, I could have used Sumo over here, uh, and that's what we want to do. We eventually want to use Sumo over here. Um, I ended up using another o regular open simulator instance over here just because so that I could reuse very easily all the protocol here between the viewer and the simulator, all this Linden protocol that's going on. So it's already there in OpenSIM, so I just basically implemented the very simple traffic simulator. Okay, so Kazias has a question. Go ahead, Kazias. Yes, uh, Kazius is asking me to spell the traffic simulator name that open source one, it's called Sumo. You can uh, Google it, Sumo Traffic Simulation. Thank you. Um, so I ended up implementing myself my own little version of a traffic simulator, which is actually quite cool. I, I, I had a lot of fun doing this. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is my very simplistic traffic simulator, how it works um, and how how certain things work here. So the traffic model is extremely simple. Um, you know, if you look at Sumo and some of the other professional commercial traffic simulators, you'll see a lot more sophisticated models going on. Um, what I did is, uh, I just very simple model, the vehicles are generated periodically, I don't remember, the, I think it's like, like every 10 seconds or so, it's, it's configurable. Every few seconds I generate a vehicle. Um, the type of vehicle is chosen randomly, so I have different types of vehicles. I have regular cars, taxis, buses, the pod cars, the train, um, the bicycles. Yeah, so those are the ones that I have right now. And so there's a probability distribution that I use to, 
to choose randomly between these different types. So there are more cars than taxis, there are more taxis than buses and things like that. Uh, the association between um, the vehicles and the routes uh, is done sort of randomly. So each type of vehicle has a, a, a set of possible routes. And uh, when I generate the vehicle, I associate that vehicle with one of the possible routes. Um, the vehicles have collision detection, so if for some reason one of the vehicles stops, uh, the vehicles behind it that can see <laughs> uh, also stop. Um, uh, they, there, I have traffic light system going on, uh, which was really, really cool to implement. Um, and uh, things, you know, a lot more sophisticated things of traffic simulation like lane changes and things like that are not supported at all. And, uh, you know, the, the model that I use, which is vehicles that are generated periodically, is obviously n not realistic beyond a, a few hours during the day in real cities when everybody's working. Uh, there, there's a lot more, you know, sophisticated models, realistic models of how traffic works, you know, to simulate rush hours and accidents and things like that. I've done absolutely nothing of that. It's totally very, very simple. Um, okay, so the other thing that I want to talk about is routes. And routes turns out that it's the most painful thing to do, not just in our case, but I find out in lots of uh, traffic... Uh, simulation uh, cases. So, so let me show you how routes work in, in the Sumo uh, package. They have sort of an XML format for defining routes. So here's, a, here's an example. You have a vehicle type um, saying the acceleration, deceleration, some parameters, the maximum speed. And then, uh, you know, here's the route ID that you give it, the, the edge, what are the edges of the route. Uh, then the, the vehicles, these are the vehicles that are um, in, in, this, in Route 0 that departs at some point, uh, you know, some lots of parameters. So the routes themselves are given by a set of, uh, by an ID, and then a list of edges um, that, and so all of this is extremely painful to create by hand. Okay, and uh, I, I'm not entirely sure how the commercial uh, vendors do it, but it's just really, really, really hard to do. So, I mean, in order, you could get a, an image of the area from Google and you could do some magic image manipulation and try to find out where the routes are, but, you know, it, you always get it wrong because uh, it's very hard and you don't know which direction, you know, how the traffic is actually done in real life if it goes if it's only one direction or both directions so it's very it's very complicated so what we ended up doing is that we ended up doing uh, creating the routes manually um, but it turns out that um, being in an immersive environment it actually makes it slightly less painful to do the routes because you have the environment already there so what what we do is that we basically walk through the streets and I have this HUD that at every, every so often I drop a waypoint, I click on it and bang, there's a waypoint that drops. These are the waypoints, okay? These, uh, these little thingies. And, uh, and there you are, there's my route. And then I have another automatic mechanism that m makes the waypoints, toggles the waypoints between visible and invisible. And I, I want the waypoints to be there because many times the routes actually change, the requirements change. So we need to, to uh, adjust uh, the parameters on, on these waypoints. The information that uh, I have on these waypoints is very similar to the information that you see on that XML of, of the Sumo package. So you need to have information about the maximum speed, uh, you know, whether there's there are stops in there or not, what's the route ID, all of that stuff, that it needs to be there. Uh, I don't have edges because the edges are, are are basically inherently there by the fact that one waypoint is is next to the other. So it's as I'm walking along, the idea of the waypoint increments. So so that's done sort of automatically with the, the chaining of these waypoints. So bottom line, being in in, in an inverse in an immersive environment is actually quite nice to generate to to address this very painful uh, part of traffic simulation, which is to to generate the routes. Okay, so I'm coming to the end of this talk, uh, just uh, finishing up with a few uh,
couple of conclusions, some of the benefits and the limitations of what this can do. All right, so advantages of a script between, by the way, I, I didn't mention it, but so the traffic simulation is done on, on that, uh, you know, that traffic simulator server somewhere on the grid. It, it's not scripting, it's not LSL by any means. And I mean, trying to do this with LSL would just not be possible, basically. The scripting engine is just not good enough and even if it was good enough uh, you would still have to have the issue that you would have to put the script in the object itself which means that you know it, it's just it, it would be very heavy load on on that traffic simulator more than what it should so we're basically doing everything from uh, for, for in C sharp directly um, and it's a much better way of doing it because, you know, in LSL, you have to put these scripts in every individual object, whether it's, if you do it in C Sharp, you can have m many other ways of designing your simulator so that you don't, you know, it's a, a lot easier to manage all those cars. You put them in lists and you update them all, so like, like you do normal simulations. So that's, uh, I, you know, I don't even need to say what's the advantages of scripting because they're so obvious. Um, so advantages over non-distributed simulation, and by, by non-distributed simulation, I mean, well, you know, one thing that we actually tried in the beginning before going all the way doing this is that we tried to not have borders by simply have one single server that would serve as much of a large space as, as we could. So we, we used uh, mega regions at some point to avoid borders altogether. Um, that sort of works up to a certain limit because our models are relatively heavy duty. There's a lot of buildings and stuff. And so things didn't work very well when we had more than nine regions, which is, you know, less than one kilometer um, square. And obviously that just, you know, if you have a bigger uh, space, you cannot go with just one server. You need to have more servers. Um, so, so that's sort of, we, we couldn't really do that for that very large model that we had. Um, the other thing about uh, we you know, the other thing that we also tried before is to have these different servers serving different parts of the space. But then we had to deal with the border crossing, which we did at some point. It was sort of the first thing that that I did, and it's just not, as I said, not a good not a good uh, uh, solution. It's just very jerky, uh, you know, on the border crossings. It's just breaks the real dismal together. So so th we came with this and it works pretty good as you saw there in, the, in that video and uh, I'm going to continue to explore this corner of the design space of the system because it, you can do a lot of cool, cool stuff by opening connections from the viewer to some other simulator that does something else entirely different that are not supposed to be serving people visiting. So what are limitations? Well, there are some limitations. In fact, we, you, we pay a price. So one thing that we can't do very well is interaction with the vehicles, right? So a person goes and visits the urban area and sees these vehicles going around, but the vehicles are not being simulated by the same simulator where the person is. So they are all actually phantom. They're you know, not really there. So the kinds of interactions that we have are very limited. So you cannot ride the vehicles, for example, which was something that we wanted to do. Um, so there's the there's price to be paid. Um, that right now, the number of viewer region connections poses some challenges, and uh, I haven't uh, actually run this with the latest open simulator. I hope that it runs a little better. When we run this about a year ago, um, we were opening, you know, 56 connections to the viewer, and uh, if you just stayed in one region, it was okay. As soon as you try to cross the border or something, it just, it's, you know, sometimes you lost connections to some of the regions, or it, it took, you know, several seconds to cross. So it, it, it's, it's some challenges there, region crossing and, and opening so many connections between the viewer and the, and the servers. Uh, another problem, <coughs> that happens when you try to simulate 
this large of an environment, you know, three kilometers by 1.5 kilometers, is is that the the scene is massive. Okay, just the terrain is just massive, and then it, actually on top of the normal terrain, we have a mesh terrain that we generate to be uh, realistic uh, according to the real GIS um, elevation model. So those are additional meshes that we have. We have all the all the buildings, all the textual as it's just several gigabytes of data. So the way that this system is set up is that there's not a lot of possibilities for actually caching the entire scene on the client side. So every time that somebody logs in, there, yeah, there's some caching already there. If you've been there already, some of the textures are already in your um, uh, computer, but most of the scene, most of the bytes are not. So it takes a very long time to download uh, a scene of, of three kilometers by 1.5 kilometers. And by very long time, I mean, um, on the order, it can take on the order of like 20 minutes or something like that. So every time that we make a demo here, a live demo, um, the person doing the, the demo has to be aware and log in, you know, way in advance to make sure that all the objects are coming in and they're already there, uh, ready for, for doing the demo. So it would be nice to work on this system to have an alternative so that, uh, you know, in some situations like in this one, we could somehow you know, make a big zip file download for the, the person visiting and there, voila, the old scene is already there when you log in. That would be a cool thing to do. Um, okay, so this is it. If you have more questions, feel free to ask them now. Uh, and actually, now that I stopped talking, you don't need to click Oscar on my back. You can just type them in. Yes, so there's a very good question coming at, at me from, from John Andrews from Simudine. Um, yes, so the, the, uh, the cars actually are, are not even physical. I'm not even simulating the physics, physics of the cars. The, the simulator, so the traffic simulator, knows about all the, 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 the vehicles under its um, you know, simulation. So it knows where they are at any point in time. So all the collision detection and all that is done by the traffic simulator itself. And so uh, it, it's not done um, by basically the urban area that is being simulated. Um, let me put that picture back on because it's the most important picture. Just one second. Okay, so th the um, traffic simulator over here <coughs> does everything that needs to be done for, for the traffic to behave. So collision detections, it's all done here by this traffic simulation. Um, if I were to turn in, to turn on physics and simulate the cars with some dynamics or something like that, it would be done here by the traffic simulation. Um, what you see when you log in as a user, the observer, uh, you see all that behavior, whatever it's commanded here by the traffic simulator, but uh, as is because the the way that this system is implemented is that um, when you put, when this server s simulates objects outside of its own borders, um, the, the servers here uh, that corresponding to those coordinates will see those as, as phantom, basically. They're not being simulated. They're just there as an illusion, visual, basically a visual uh, artifact. So nothing in this simulator here can interact with that visual artifact. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so another good question. If two uh, different users uh, are logged in, do they see identical traffic or different? That's a very good question. In fact, brings me up to the issue of client-side versus server-side simulation. So in our case, they see exactly the same things. This is server-side simulation. <coughs> so everything that uh, this traffic simulator is doing is seen exactly as it is by anybody who logs in. So if there's a red car coming, everybody sees the red car coming. <coughs> this is different from some simulations. For example, if you would use Unity 3D for, for simulating traffic, you usually do that in, on the client side. Um, so basically, client side means that it's the machine of the person who is doing the simulation. And, and what that means is that the, the different persons connecting are going to be deep, to be seeing slightly different simulations because they are not coordinated. <coughs> so that's that's not what's going on in here. This is server side simulation, so it's synchronous. Everybody sees what's going on at the same time. Was there a question that I missed? Ah, yes. So, Fauris is asking a good question. Is this only 3D simulation or is there a plan to be extended with a real-life link like RFID or GPS? Okay, so there's actually a project going on that uh, the our my colleague at Incitra is um, trying to negotiate with some people there um, to to um, have um, <coughs> some of the buzzes uh, be the real buzzes. So we would uh, hook on to the GPS um, of of uh, apparently the the buzzes there are already in, uh, equipped with GPS tape so that uh, people know where they are. So we would hook on to that stream of data. And uh, and basically use that as uh, the position of the of the virtual buses in the environment. That we are hopefully going to do that. <coughs> okay, and I have a um, uh, another question from Fabrice. What type of uh, server is needed to scale this simulation? <clears throat> so we are using a server right now. We've experimented with different things, including with Amazon EC2 instances. Uh, they're not very good. Um, so we ended up, uh, whenever we have one of these uh, environments to, to model and simulate, we, we actually um, rent one of those big servers, like, like not, not very different from the ones that we are running the conference. So these are very big servers with a lot of memory and a lot of, uh, of cores. <coughs> And where we can run the, where we can, uh, we try to run the entire environment in in those big servers, uh, just like we are doing here. As you see, we have a bunch of regions on this grid, and all this grid is actually being run by one single server with 24 cores. Uh, so that's sort of our our preference is to to work with one single physical server with a lot of uh, CPUs and put all the simulation in that uh, physical server and that is going that then is distributed by the, the different CPUs. But we tend to use good good servers rather than cheap ones. Okay, so there's a question, what was the problem with EC2? <coughs> uh, so EC2 instances are just not very good, basically. <laughs> they're just very slow. Um, you know, their access to the disk is just really bad. It's just slow. Everything is slow. And uh, you can do it, but for high-performing things, you probably want to do something else, basically. We just ended up... Um, uh, having a lot more bang for the buck by renting these much better servers. Plus, with, with EC2, there's a lot of extra management because you have all these different instances going on at the same time that you have to coordinate in forming to a, a, a single grid. And it's just, from the point of view of the, the system administration, it's just much, much simpler to have to do everything in one single physical server, which is what we're doing here in the conference, too. So, we, it's just, I mean, from the point of view of the human effort, 
it's just much better to work with a, a powerful server, one, than to work with many virtual servers that many things are going on and can be going on in there. <coughs> there was another question. Uh, uh, Kasia say I missed the point of how you smooth the border crossing. So, yes, so there are no border crossings whatsoever in this, uh, in this architecture. Um, the, the, this traffic simulator, the green traffic simulator, just puts the cars wherever it wants. Uh, you know, in any, t any point between, let's say, that this is uh, coordinate 1,000 meters to coordinate 2,000 meters. Okay, so uh, basically, the, this server just puts moves the car or whatever it wants. So, oh, by the avatars. So, uh, so Kasia is asking border crossings for avatars. That's one thing that we just haven't solved yet. Uh, we have that's next on our list to improve in OpenSIM in general is border crossings for avatars, and in particular where there's uh, there's a lot of child agents all around, many connections from the viewer to the backend server. We just need to improve that. Okay, so if there are, if you have further questions, feel free to catch me in the IRC or um, you know by email if you want. Um, otherwise, I, the last thing I have another session, the hypergrid panel, to be on next. And uh, the last thing I do before I leave here is to post here the URL of my slides if you are interested in downloading the, sli the slides. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, Krista, for a terrific presentation. As a reminder to our audience, you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Thank you again to our speaker and the audience.